Oh yeah, what are y'all talking about? Huh? Yep. So, uh, yeah, we'll stop. so everybody okay on push buttons? The different parts of the push button. The operator, legend plate is very. We, we see legend plates, but what happens in this class? We have people. It's a push button, guys. And it says you need a normally open push button. It's like, said, well, it's way we'll start, but it's a what? It's a push button. So don't pay any attention in here to the to the labels. Just look for normally open, normally closed switch. Y'all understand normally open, normally closed. What's normally open push button? I like that. It means it's normal position. The switch is open. When you press it, it does what? Close. So normally close push button is normally what? Close. And when you press it, open, right? But okay. And what are the symbols? There's no such thing as a, if the book says it, there's no such thing as a normally open, hell closed push button. That we have, we have, we have, and uh, the guy, and why I brought that up is the guy in PLCs shows a symbol of a normally open, hell closed push button. So, I mean, some sucker is standing there doing what? <laughs> so, this is, yeah, so this is a normally open push button. Now, the guy does a very poor job, but he'll put these things down right like this. Normally, I draw them up. So a push button, uh, our push buttons are what we call normally, uh, uh, they're spring-loaded push buttons. Momentary contacts, what they call That's what I was trying to give out, which means they got a spring in them. So they'll stay in their normal position until you change them. As soon as you let your finger off, they'll go back to their normal position. Everybody understand that? Uh, so this is normally open. It's drawn above the line, and then a normally closed push button is drawn below the line. Yeah, pushing it back up. Yeah. So these are symbols for push buttons, and then of course we'll give this thing a label. So normally what we'll do is we'll label it with what it does. Uh, out, so we'll, on our diagram, we'll put the label, and normally what we do is we write the label above it, the same thing that's on the what? That's on the legend plate, on your diagrams. So all your push buttons should be labeled, right? And then how do we identify the push button? We put a legend plate on there that's got the same name as what's on the diagrams. Are we okay? Uh, we don't normally use these in motor controls. We don't normally use these symbols. In PLCs, we would. Uh, these are the symbols we use right here. I don't know where the guy got that. But... These are selector switches, okay. Oh, this is the push button on the pot. On the, uh, these are what we call selector switches. These are manually operated. I, uh, I hope the book says we see very we see very few toggle switches. And we see a lot of selector switches. Uh, selector switches can be spring loaded, or they can be indented, which means they do what uh, they'll stay in a certain position to you move it. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with control devices that people, that operators that are wearing gloves can, can operate. So this is why our push buttons are nice and big, right? Understand. Um, where you have that, and then they've got a metal, of, let's see if they give us the name on that. No, they don't. They got this protection ring right here. Uh, this is a, that normally, 
the push button is inside this protection ring. So what it does, it prevents you from from accidentally doing what, you know, bumping up against it. Um, this looks like it might be an e-stop button. E-stop buttons, we don't do that. E-stop buttons are set up so you can operate them with a palm. But normally, uh, on an e-stop button, e-stop buttons have got to be normally closed. And then they'll have a little guy like that on the top, indicating it's a mushroom top, right? You know, these are going to be your e-stop uh, Our e-stop buttons, uh, of course, you can see our nice big mushroom head button right up there. And so you can do what? You can operate it real fast. Uh, ours uh, has an indent in it. Now, normally, if it's got a, a indent or a holder, you know, I'm trying to draw up here. Uh, it'll have a little notch cut in this operator right here, indicating it's indented, which means when you push it in, it's going to do stay until you pull it out. Uh, I don't know the symbol. I have to go back and look. Some of them, they actually when they lock, they lock down in the e-stop position, and you literally got to do uh, you got to push on them and do what? Rotate them and pull them out, yeah. Yeah, they do. So that, those usually have a uh, arrow on the on the top of the button head that tells you which direction. To... So these are, of course, our, uh, I think I showed y'all the, the, the switch. Let's see if I can find it. So this is a push button. It's got uh, normal close, and then it's got a normal open. So this is a two-pole single throw push button. A lot of your industry push buttons are you buy an operator. And then you have the ability to add contacts to it. So these are actually contacts that we can physically add. So this guy's got a normally close, normally close, normally close, a normally open, normally close, normally open, normally open, normally open. And you can see how many they've stacked on these guys right here. No, those are just. So what happens is we know if we've got two push buttons. That are mechanically, we can we can have push buttons that's got multiple contacts. So let's do a normally open, and then it's also got a normally closed on it, and they're totally isolated from each other. And if we're if they're mechanically connected, we put a dashed line into in between them like that, indicating that it's the same push button. It's, it's a different contact operated by the same operator. That makes sense. And then, of course, if we can't put them in the same line, what do we do? Anybody remember? Uh, what we'll do is we'll come down here. And if this is in line 3, and then this is in line 10, then we put this little upside-down house here. And then we'll put a 10. And down here, we'll put the same thing pointing to what? And this one will have three. And this is tells us where the contacts are actually controlled by the same operator. This is if you can't do what? If you can't, what you try to do on your, on your, on your diagram, on your diagram, you try to make it the logical operation of the circuit. So uh, sometimes these switches that's controlled by the same operator are not in consecutive lines. So what we'd have to do is we, we use these little symbols right here, if y'all remember. We've already gone over that, uh, where we just put these little houses, and they're actually arrows pointing to and giving you the line number where the other switch is operated by the same operator. At. So we're passing around this guy right here, which is a two-pole single throw. So two poles are the number of switches or number of circuits we can control with one operator. Uh, the number of throws is the number of posi uh, positions that can be put in. I said, right? So this has got two poles, 
and each one of them can put in a single. No, I'm sorry. This is this is a, normally when we do a terminals. So a solid dot means we've got a connection. An open circle it means it's something we can connect to. Okay. So what we have on this one is we have two switch. We have one operator controlling two contacts, right? You understand? So that means this would be a double pole. And then each one of them can control two circuits. So this set here would be a double pole, uh, double throw. Makes sense. So this guy right here would be a single pole, single throw. It should have been a D, by the way, sorry. What would this one right here be? Single pole, double throw because it's got two things it can control. This right here, I can't see. I don't know what they got down here. But this over here would be a double pole, double throw. So I don't know what it, well, oh, one normally, I see what I, I was trying, not one normally open, one normally close. Uh, this, there's no pole down here. So this is still, I'm, I'm seeing things that's not there. Let me get this. Yeah, this would be a single pole. I didn't see that. A single throw, thank you. And this would be a what? Yeah, single pole, double throw. Let's redo these so we can make sure we get these right. Okay, these are I, what I did as I saw these. So this would be a single pole, single throw. This right here would be a single pole, single throw. This right here would be a single pole, double throw. And this right here would be a double pole, single throw. And that guy right there have a, would have a bunch of throws on it, right? Uh, these selector switches, uh, the two position selector switch, the dash line shows you, uh, if you put it in auto, this will close, the solder line is this one, that will close. We use a lot of selector switch, uh, this is the temperature switch, the sensitive temperature, and y'all are supposed to read this, guys, so I'm, no, this is the one I didn't put up there, right? Sorry. Uh, this would be what we've got. Now, our selector switch is this guy right here. It's a three position selector switch with a center off. So, if I put it in auto, the bottom one's going to close. If I put it in manual, this one, so I put it, if I put it in auto, this will open, this will close, and I need to be showing that. If I put it in manual, uh, this one will close and this one will open. If I put it in the center, then neither one of them's going to be closed. So this is the selector switch that you have on your panel right here. Three position selector switch with a, with a center off. Now here they're called a manual and auto, but that would that would be what's on the legend plate. Now in this class, it don't make any difference what the legend plates. If you understand, we got a three position a selector switch. Uh, when you put it in one position, one, con one contact is going to close, the other one's going to open. If you put it in the other position, they're going to switch to each other. If you put it in the center position, then what? Both of them's open, right? Uh, this is a uh, two position selector switch. It's a little different, but instead of putting all the dashes, uh, they put what we call a truth table over on the side. An X, is, X means that that's the contact that's closed, and the O means that's the contact that's open. That makes sense? Everybody okay? What page are all these on the book?
Uh, this is a, a four position joystick and we can do it with a truth table right you understand that and uh, or the way they do it here is they put a dot on which position so if i move it to the right this contact would close if I, and all the rest of them would be open if i move it to the left this contact would close you see that it's got the dot on that side if i move it away from me this contact will close if i move it toward me this contact will close I think most of our uh, positions, our joysticks now are multi-position. We're we okay on that one. Okay, y'all understand the truth table. So contact A will close if I move it to the right. Contact B will close if I move it to the left. Contact C will close if I move it up. And contact X will close when I move it down. These are limit switches, guys. These are still used all over the place. Now, these are electromechanical devices. Sometimes they operate in one direction. This guy here only operates in one. Uh, sometimes they operate in one direction. Sometimes they operate in both directions. So they change something in both directions. Sometimes they have a uh, push instead of being a ro rotating uh, operator. You it pushes in. We have a, what we call a plunger type. These guys, right, these guys right here, are a lot cheaper than solid state uh, sensors. They're very durable. Uh, if you take care of them, if you mount them right, um, the biggest problem we have is people don't mount them right, and the operator gets broke off of them. Um, also, they'll so they'll come in and they'll take off all the covers and everything, and. Uh, then they don't put them back on there when they're making measurements. They won't put the covers on it, and the gunk will get inside of uh, the bottom seal. Uh, uses a, you know, a wire clamp seal on the bottom of it. You can see it's gone off this one. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we like to take things apart, but we don't like to put them back together the way they were intended to do. Uh, so a lot of times, if we don't assemble these things, uh, plus these are electromechanical devices, which means what? They can fail in two ways, but they're so cost effective and they're, and they're really rugged if we take care of them. But the problem is, uh, they're a lot cheaper than solid solid state sensors like Holosec or different types of uh, electronic sensors that we have. But these are what are called contact sensors, which means what they have to make physical contact with what they're measuring. We used to uh, we call them limit switches because that's basically what they were originally was used for. Uh, but now we use them to count. We use them to do all kind of stuff. You know, all it's got to do, something's got to do what? It's got to move that operator. This is what we call pilot, pilot duty or heavy duty. Uh, these guys right here are designed to run loads, so we can literally have a load running off this thing. Uh, most of your new ones on PLCs are what we call electronic duty. They're little tiny things. So these guys don't run loads. They do what? Uh, they put into a PLC, which requires very little current. Uh, but these things do the same way. Are we okay? So these are limit switches. They got the name. So this is like a, uh, when we first got computers, uh, the uh, operating system was built in. Uh, now most of our uh, um, our computers use what we call a disk-based operating system, uh, which is, so all a computer can do is run a program. So what we have is we have a we have a program that makes it operate. It's got all the programs that make everything work in there, and we call those operating systems. So operating systems are the programs that make the computer operate. And then we have what we call applications that we have our apps before. All an app does is apply the operating system to run the inside of the computer. So that's why we call them applications that apply the operating system. So that's how they got their name. Uh, uh, the original operating system was called a disk operating system because we loaded it off the disk in some memory. After that, almost every operating system for computers are disk based operating systems, so we don't call them disk based, they give them other names. So we've got all types of sensors that does what this does. But this 
this one is called a limit switch. Even though it's what we call a proximity sensor, it senses when something's at a certain position. We don't call it a proximity sensor, we call it a what? A limit switch. And all your other proximity sensors have got their own names. So tell So now y'all know what an uh, operating system is, right? So it's the programs that make the computer do what? Work. <laughs> and then you have applications. What do these apps do? They apply the operating system. So everything that makes the computer work is part of your operating system. And what's our three main, we, well, basically two now. What's the two main operating systems we have for our cell phones? iOS and Android. You know, those are two primary. You know, Windows is still up there a little bit, but not as big as it. You know. So that's what's making your phone operate. And then it's got a program called a shell that allows you to control the operating system. So when you hit the front, hit the front panel, you're playing around with the shell. So you will know, learn a little bit about computers. So these are the symbols. We've got four symbols. These guys can be held open, and these guys can be held closed. Uh, what this means is that it's wherever you park that, what's the normal position of the equipment you're operating in. Usually every piece of equipment that has a limit, we park it or stop it somewhere, right? So that means a normally open could be held closed when it's in its, when it's in its static position. And a normally open and a normally closed could be what? Held open. So what we're going to do on these symbols is we look and see what gravity is trying to do. If gravity is trying to close it, then it must be held open. If gravity is trying to close it and it's already closed, then it's going to be normally closed, right? You understand what I'm saying? So let's look at these symbols. So what's gravity trying to do with this one? It's trying to close it. So it's normally closed, right? You understand. What's gravity trying to do with this one? It's trying to open it. So it's a normally open. What's gravity trying to do with this one? Trying to open it so it must be held closed. What's gravity trying to do with this one? Trying to close it so it must be a normally closed, held open. You all understand that? So that's what we do on these limit switches. And what we do in our, in our diagram is we draw the symbol when the machine is at its normal parked position. So just about any machine when you leave for the day, it's going to have to be at a certain location, right? You understand? I mean, not all of them, but some of them. Some of them don't care. <laughs> you know, so this is where we came up with these. So uh, if you see a push button, it says normally open, hell closed. I mean, somebody's got to be standing there doing one. So there's no system. Even though the PLC book does teach that. So this is the only place I know where those come into play is on these limit switches. So the symbol, y'all see the symbol? So it's got two connection terminals. Those should be drawn open, even though uh, if somebody still uh, draws them in, I wouldn't fire them. But I, this is this is the standard. And then what we do is we put that little ramp or that little uh, incline on there indicating it's a limit switch. Okay, okay. Uh, this is showing you if you run them on DC, you shouldn't hook up. Uh, you shouldn't hook up the load on this side. The load should be where? On this side. Because when the limit switch is de energy, when, the, uh, when this is a, it's a two position, we could actually end up with a, a situation where we have different polarities uh, on our contacts, and it could are. But it's, we, don't, we don't ever put our loads on this side anyway. If this is L1, loads don't go on this side. Loads are supposed to go on what side? On this side, right? Uh, these are just pictures of different things it's doing. Uh, operators. Uh, these are operators. We have all different types of operators. Waffle stick. Push roller. This is very important. Uh, uh, fork lever. We, we, we had one of these around here somewhere. And then, of course, what you're looking at is just a simple lever. A lot of your, some of your blocks, these are the blocks, you can actually come in and put a different, uh, a module on it to change it from a from a rubber type to a plunger type. 
Uh, the one that we got don't give you that option. Are we okay? Uh, some of the things you need to take in consideration is how far the limb fish can travel. If you make it travel further than what it's supposed to, you could actually do a you can break the operator off. Uh, these guys are operated by all kinds of stuff. Cam, Subway. We have a. Uh, so where did I get? Did I get anything over there yet? No. So here we got this station. Y'all got to watch out for me. So this is the one that's closed. Uh, this is called a cycle timer, but it's a cam operator. So this is what we call a pilot duty switch. And this is geared, by the way, so don't try to turn the motor because you'll strip it out. I didn't hook up my camera, guys. I don't want to do that. Dang it. I'll pass this around with y'all see. I just want to put it on the recording, which I didn't show the limit switch. So here's the cam right here, and it's running off of a little AC motor. And then this is the little limit switch over here. This is what we call an electronic duty. You're going to run into a lot of these now because most of our control circuits are done with PLCs. You know. This is a single pole double throw. And somewhere over here, probably should be. Or you can use a lot to find out how far it's single pole. It's a single pole double throw. What could you use to figure out which contacts are which? Starts with, a, it's a certain meter, starts with an O. Home meter, yeah. So a lot of these switches and relay, you know, a lot of your limit switches and stuff like that, you can figure out what the poles are and the throws are with nothing but an ohm meter. Uh, so how much resistance do a closed switch have? Almost none. That's going to be on test somewhere, guys. And then how much resistance should an open switch have? Almost. Our meter, our meter can't measure. There's no such thing as infinite resistance, right? There's no resistance. Nothing would move. So our meter shows overload, which means the resistance is so high we can't what? Yeah, we can't read it. So these are just examples of limit switches. You see these a lot used on. And then, of course, when you mount them, you got to be uh, concerned with where you mount these things at. Uh -huh. So we want to mount them where they're going to be real hot. We don't want to mount them where they're going to get into uh, shavings. We want to mount them out of the way. We, we don't want to mount them so some idiot would come over there and accidentally actuate it, right? So these guys use the control thing. And, uh, the problem we have with guys, and I use this story all the time, most guys, if they see a switch somewhere, what are they going to do? They're going to flip it to see what it does. Most women will do what? I ask what it does before they flip it. We've we got a switch on the wall. We've got a story. This is true. It's a In our last there were originally four autos, and then we moved in and we got access to one that I want to put on the wall. It's a regular switch. It's a good condition spring loaded switch, but it looks like it's a ball switch. If you flip it up, it can be more powerful than that. And then two, that's hard to push it down and kill the power. If you push it up, you can then switch up the arena and then power the contact or near it and close the power. We would be at home and we can have this computer thing in the lab. We can come in here and get a lot of resistance. No, it does not ever matter. So 
God can do a Oh, by the way, I need to go back over and put it back on there because uh, when uh, when Stacks came through, Nancy took my paper off. Foot switches, y'all see a symbol for foot switches? These are pretty. Most of these guys are very skinny. I mean, there's nothing to them, right? Uh, these are foot switches, which means you operate them when you want. Your foot, some of them have a heel to toe. So you push it and like toe down and energize one switch. You push it down the other way to energize the other, right? That's it, symbol for a foot switch, right? Everybody okay there? You think these symbols are going to be on not this test, but the next test? Yeah. A uh, light switch. This is a three wire. This is a three wire switch. Uh, uh, by the way, they changed its color code too. Most of the time, uh, the new color code that we use is a uh, that you're going to see is. I don't know if I can do the colors. I can't. Yeah, I can. Uh, normally, uh, now this right here is going to be brown. Uh, this guy's going to be blue. And this guy's going to be black. It gets us confused over here because normally we think of black is going to L2, right? You understand that? So one thing you need to do is they don't, most of these sensors, these electronic sensors or solid state sensors, uh, now the simple wires coming out, and of course, it'll come with a little leaflet, right? You understand that? That will give you the actual true color code uh, to hook these things up. Uh, if you lose that leaflet, then what you need to do is go on the internet and type in the part number, right, and make sure you hook that thing up. It's different. But this is pretty much what the industry standard now for hooking these things up. Is, uh, the brown lead goes for L1. Your blue lead goes toward L2, and your black lead is actually the output of the sensor. Uh, this one they identify, we haven't seen much, so it's a three part sensor, two for power, one for output. And of course, uh, so it's got to be powered up, so these sensors we have to hook between L1 and L2. Are we okay? So I could show y'all some of these. Uh, our light sensor. Uh, Okay, let me go pause it and pass this around. Y'all gonna make sure it gets back up here, right? So this is the head that actually picks up the light. And here's the colors. You know, see the colors? What's the colors? Brown, black, blue. So brown would go back toward L1. Blue would go to L2, and that's your output right there. Now, a two-wire sensor kind of gets us confused because it's only got two wires. <laughs> this is a sensor that will wire up. This is an inductive sensor. It's a solid-state limit switch, but this is an inductive sensor. So this picks up metal. It's got two wires. Brown goes toward L1. Blue goes toward the load. So here's where they change the color code. This is a two-wire sensor. So this guy is a 120 volt sensor. It's going to drop about four volts, uh, but it still lays about 116 volts. Um, this is not a sensor. This is a float switch, and we have two of them on here. These are not color coded because they're not solid state, so they're just a switch. If it's a switch, you don't care what's L1 and L2, it's just a lot, it's a switch. If it's solid state, then you gotta power that thing up correctly. So these are liquid level flood switches, liquid level switches. They won't be color coded. <laughs> this is a temperature sensor, and uh, 
the problem we have is that this guy operates off of 24 volts, but we're controlling 120 volts. So what we do is we, we power this thing up on a power supply right here. And then we have control relays that takes the 24 volts and allows us to switch 120 volts. Here's the color code on this sensor. Uh, Y'all can see a brown, black, blue, and white. Uh, this is what we call a four wire sensor. So this has a normally closed contact. It's got a single pole. Simulate contact. So when the book gives you the color code, odds are the color code that the book gives you is not correct for these sensors now, right? Everybody okay? So like anything you see in a in a diamond shape. It means it is a what we call a solid state sensor. These are electronic sensors. And they're going to have to be powered. On a high voltage circuit, they might be powered through the load, right? Or it might be a three wire sensor, which has one normally open contact. So the blue, uh, I'm sorry, the black wire is a normally open contact. If it's got a normally closed contact in there, it will be white. And that's the standard color code. So the temperature sensor is actually a single pole double throw. So sometimes our tray is kind of confusing. So we have two types of sensors that's used all over the place. We have a inductive sensor, which can sense nothing but metal. And then we have a passive sensor that can sense metal and it can sense metal and solid things and these are passive sensors. Both of them they refer to as solid state sensors. So you know, if you can come up there you can do this and it's trigger because it's got to be a passive sensor where you don't have a lot of you don't have metal in your Yeah, so uh, capacitive sensors can uh, sense the solids and liquids. But they use the same symbol. So the problem we have in, in uh, now switches have their own symbol. Solid state sensors, we use a lot. We use the diamond shape. And they're going to be called solid state limit switches, even though one of them might be a lot. So that's where we get, it gets kind of confusing. If we have a switch, the switch has its own individual symbol. This temperature sensor, right? I'm sorry, this pressure sensor. How it does it, we're not concerned with. This is the symbol for a pressure switch. So it's basically the same symbol that we have on a float switch or liquid level switch, but it's going to have a what? It's going to have a half shell like that. We okay? Everybody okay? The pressure switches, different types. That's okay. We'll learn that. If you take sensors, we'll learn the different types. Pressure switch, pressure switch, a temp switch. Everybody see the switch on a temp switch? The symbol. Temp switch, temp switch. And we'll look at the different types of sensors, uh, uh, the different types. When you do take the sensors class, and we'll talk about the mister thermocouples. These guys are not switches. These guys are uh, analog devices. So a switch would be what we call a digital or binary device, which is means it's either one. No problem. An analog device is a device that gives us something that's proportional to what is on the metal. So we've got a tire pressure image. So that would be analog or would that be digital? It's analog because it actually shows you what the pressure. Right. So the analog. Um, a temp sensor, we can have a temperature switch that trips at a certain temperature. Or we can have a temperature sensor, which is what's on your thermostat. thermostat. So if you got a thermostat in your house, that is analog, right? Understand? Which means it doesn't give you we control a digital switch to determine when 
in our law. When our units turn on and turn off, the actual sensor is got the glove. Analog. So these are analog sensors. Uh, we have thermal couples. We have the misters. The misters are really cheap. It's just that they're not linear. Linear means a straight line. You understand that? Normally, what we do with thermal couples is we operate it over, I mean, I'm sorry, a thimister, is we operate it over a narrow range. If we operate it over a narrow range, then it appears to be linear, right? You understand? Yes or no? So, if you've got a, if you've got a digital thermostat in your house, it uses a thermometer. I mean, I'm sorry, it uses a thimister, which is a, what do you think it changes when, when it, with temperature? Thermistor, thermistor. What what quantity does it change? We got three, right? So what does it change? What what quantity? We we can change. We could change three things. What's the three things a sensor can change? It can control the voltage. It can control the current. Or it can change its Source of the R resistance. Thermistor. What do you think a thermistor changes? That's what it measures, but what does it change to measure the temperature? It can't output, it can't output to a, a sensor cannot output to a circuit a temperature. My electronic circuit does not know temperature. It either knows voltage, or it knows a current, or it knows a resistance. Thermistor. Resistor. So a thermistor changes its resistance with temperature. So it varies its resistance. Thermistor is sent term for temperature, and then we finish up resistor, right? So it basically tells you what it does. The problem we have is nonlinear, which means what? A linear means it varies in a straight line. So that means at, at at one temperature, it might have a, it might have a certain resistance, and it drops down. It would have another resistance, but it's not going to be in a straight line. But what we do with thermistors is we don't operate it over their entire range. We operate it over an area right? like your house. What temperature does your house operate between? What's the lowest temperature you usually say? Huh? Yeah, and then it's high as yeah. So what we're talking about is a very what? Very sensitive range. You operate your house usually between sit in the upper 60s and lower 70s, right? So if you operate a thermistor over a very narrow range, then it appears to be linear, very friendly. Uh, and it also can be compensated with electronics. Uh, a a uh, thermal couple generates a voltage, so it actually gives you a voltage that's proportional to temperature. So look at the line on the, on the thermal couple. It's a what? It's a straight line, which means that what? It's linear, which means now we can say, you know, two volts per degree, right? So at 30 volts, it gave me, right, at 30 volts, it was 45 degrees, right? And then, then 50 volts, what would that be? Two volts per degree, that would be, that would be, what did I say first? It was five, five degrees, right? So that's what's nice about linear. Uh, where do y'all run a thermal couple in your house? Well, where do we want a very precise temperature? Your oven. Your oven uses thermal couple. So it's a really precise temperature. So once I calibrate it, then 350 degrees is probably what? 350 degrees. So anytime I want precision over a wide range, I'll start to use uh, something that has a linear output. Right? And a thermal couple does that. It also generates voltage which means we can get work out of this without having an external power source. So a thermistor, uh, we can't send a resistance. We have to either send a voltage or a current. So usually a thermistor requires another component, right? You understand to convert it into uh, some type of voltage. Uh, this guy right here generates a voltage. So if you've got, you know, you've got a gas water heater in your house, uh, how does it know the pilot light is lit? Does it does it plug into the wall? Your gas water heater. Well, how in the world is there something available to open and close the main gas valve? 
How does it know the pilot light is lit? How does it know the pilot light? It uses a thermocouple. So there's a little thermocouple that fits up in there. It knows the power light's lit, and it uses that output voltage to control the main gas now. So it powers itself, right? So if you got a gas water heater, it has no watt. It has no plug because it runs off of watt. It, it, it's able to switch that main, main gas valve. But first of all, it knows that the pilot light's lit. So the pilot light's not lit. There's no voltage available to switch the main valve, right? Which we wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> So that little wire that runs up there, if you've ever looked down there, there's a little wire that's there sitting right, in there, sitting right out the tip with a pilot like that, right? That's a thermocouple. So thermocouples, we uh, we, won't, we use thermocouples for accuracy. Uh, we use thermistors for price. And normally if we use thermistors, it's over a lot. It's over a very narrow range. Does well, that make sense? So these are analog. We won't be using any of these uh, here. Uh, uh, like I said, in this class, the only sensor we're going to use is a solid state limit switch. It is going to be an inductive sensor. And what does an inductive sensor stand? Let's talk about it while I go, guys. Everybody did better than this. Sensors sense, right? So, sensors sense. In that lab, you'll just take your trigger key and put it, put it up there and it's triggered. Uh, distance is determined by the type of metal bundle. So, we put the sensors in big bundle aluminum, even though they're basically under the what we call the contrary. We get aluminum real close to the Seen this before. Uh, when I was on my motorcycle, uh, when this switch was working up here, on my motorcycle, I pulled up on the inductive sensor out there and it didn't trip. I said they were from Malibu. So if there was cars, I had no problem. If I left late, I would just put my kids van down over there and hit the crosswalk uh, to get the light and start running. But it was adjusted so it didn't pick up. And some of them, you can see that most of the time they have to adjust. Sometimes it's not going to do that. You don't want to switch it. There's only one car, right? You have to wait for multiple cars to get there. So, guys, I think that's all the sensors this guy talks about or control devices. Uh, thermistors, we talked about that. Flow, I'm sorry, flow switch. We don't have any slow, flow switches in here. So, what is flow? What flow senses the movement of fluids? What is the fluid? No. Fluid is something that has no fixed shape, it takes the shape of whatever it puts in, and it moves easily, it moves easily. fluid power classes, uh, I learned that fluids were not just liquids. So flow meter, flow flow uh, switches detect what? The movement of fluids. Anybody know the symbol for a flow switch? A little flag, yeah. We're doing. We're just doing the normally opens. That's supposed to be a flag, guys. So it's kind of like a uh, the flag flapping in wind, right? Is 
normally open, normally close. The only time that gravity thing comes into play is when you're dealing with limit switches. So normally on our other switches, the normally open is, is above the line, and the normally close are below the line. So it's just like the push buttons, right? So don't get confused there. Flow switches, these are just examples. So I got a I got a uh, combo unit on my house, which means it's got uh, it's got electric air conditioning, it's got gas, uh, it's got gas in, and uh, they, they don't have a uh, they don't have a they don't have a uh, pilot light on it. It's got a spark plug. It's got an arcer. So what they do though, before that arc is off, they want to make sure there is no absolutely no gas in that chamber when they arc. It. They want to start the arc and then put the gas in there. They don't have to have gas in there and then arc. It. Uh, so what they do is before the gas comes on, they put a purge fan on it, turns on, and it evacuates the gas that's in there. And they want to make dang sure that that purge fan comes on. So what do I have on it? I got a flow switch. Which is nothing but a little vein sticking down there. When the fan comes on it does a lot. Push it back and then they know the purge fan is before they actually pump before they turn the arc uh, the arc on and then they can go. So you'll run into these guys all the time. Anytime that we're trying to sense the flow of a fluid. Is, that, is there any more in here? Uh, smoke detectors, we're not going to look at that. Those are just something the guy threw in there. Uh, float switches, we showed you all those, right? We okay there? I showed you all the float switches. Where do we have float switches at in our house? All it, yeah, but it's not controlling electricity. It's controlling water, right? That's a flood switch anywhere else. Water heater, because it's only going to maintain a certain output here, right? Anywhere else? Probably washing machine. Yeah, washing machine. Sometimes washing machines will work on a tile, but sometimes they don't. Everybody okay on float switches? The symbol. So it looks like a pressure switch, but the ball is completed, right? Everybody okay there? Mm -hmm. Float switches. And these are analog. We're not going to run into those in this class. So we'll talk about a lot of these uh, class, these other sensors, the analog sensors, and the uh, longer digital sensors when we get into if you take those. Class. So any questions on this chapter, guys? So what are we going to do about the test? Well, those computers down there still don't work. Well, they work. They just won't get onto the new blackboard. Uh, for some reason, when they rewired the wireless for this class for the building, we're going over to a new wireless. Um, guess what they did? They didn't do that. They didn't put any access point on there. We don't use their new computers down here, but our main computer has its own wireless. We didn't put that in there. put a new access point down there. So, uh, suppose we're supposed to get one. And right now, well, the way it's set up for some reason, we can't get logged on to the new Bible. Uh, it'll go thought right what happened. Enter your username, enter that, new, that purple. I don't know how long it's been down there. Well, we're fixing to break, and then we'll go to lab. Uh, we're, we're ready to do quite a few labs. Uh, and then what we're going to do is this test right here, we're going to let you know. So everybody's got internet access to something on home, right? Or get somewhere we need internet access. Yeah, okay, on Blackboard at home. You know, Blackboard also. Everybody's just running around with that, right? Uh, all I got is I got one figure page that I'll run off and I'll give you. But what I'll also is I'll put it in the folder with the test. So if you do the if you do the picture, what can you do? You can print it off the But I'll give it off to you, I'll give it off to you in class. Okay. So what I'll do 
Everybody's getting text. Everybody's getting text. 